Holy tongue twister, Tim. Whenever we discuss Cliff Robertson's appearances on Batman, I keep trying to say shame with an M. But thanks to the original Western, I can't stop saying Shane with an N. Hmm. Well, Paul, I know just the thing to solve this conundrum. Try saying this. The blame for shame rests mainly in Ralph Ross's brain. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Here it goes. The blame for shame rests mainly in Ralph Ross's brain. I think he's got it. By Jove, he's got it. But why would I want to say that? It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't matter, chum. It's just an elocution exercise. Oh, right. Like, you say clavicle and I say clavorkel, right? Clavorkel? To, to the, the bat, bat poles! <laughs> Welcome to To The Bat Poles. Those aren't nuts, boy. They're Tim and Paul. Well, maybe both things can be true. Uh, he's Paul. I'm Tim. We're brothers on opposite sides of the Pacific. Uh, how is life in New Hampshire? Well, um, I'm still in New Hampshire. Today I'm in, in Portsmouth, um, which is about a two-hour drive from, from um, Hanover, where I reside. And uh, eh, things are pretty good here. Hotel room's a little cold, but, you know, I, I keep it that way. So it's <laughs> it's my fault. <laughs> it is chilly here, though, It's uh, but it's warmer than it is in Hanover. It's in the 20s in Hanover and in the 30s um, here closer to oh, um, heat wave. closer to the port. Yeah, it's, it was in the 50s here in Tokyo today. Mm. You can tell we're from Iowa because we always start with the weather, um, well, at least a good chunk of the time, just like the farmers always do. Our theme version this time was from the Solid Ghost Band, uploaded to their self-titled YouTube channel February 23rd, 2021. Uh, the video shows that they're a three-piece. Uh, there are two different cameras on the drummer throughout this video. Uh, his name is Dusty Fletcher. And one each of the guitarist, James Dense, and the bassist, Steve Farr. And boy, that's some bone-shaking bass. <laughs> yeah, they're quite good. It looks like they're doing kind of end of, or not really end, but um, end, end of quarantine, um, separate recording. They're yeah, zooming. I couldn't tell. It, it did seem like they were maybe in separate places, although the walls were all the same color, so... Mm. Yeah, I wasn't maybe. Quite sure, but you couldn't see them like overlapping into each other's camera shots. So mm -hmm. they they might twenty twenty one. They may very well have been in different locations for COVID reasons. Right, just trying to be safe. Well, it seems like it'd be a little hard to get in sync, but. Oh, you know, there's a lot. There was a lot of that going on. Um, a lot of multiple location bands um, doing you know, more or less broadcasting um, and also recording stuff like that. In fact, um, uh, the two surviving members of the Knack uh, did a version of My Sharona called By Corona um, in 2020, where they were in separate locations and they played a live rendition of, um, you know, the what they could when, and uh, played in the other two parts. I think mm. it was the, the bass and the um, rhythm guitar. So the lead guitarist is still alive, and the drummer, I believe, is still alive. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, you know, it was perfectly in sync. So it's apparently, you know, something you can't do if you're a professional musician and have the equipment. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think with a Skype with a Skype connection or something like that, you can't get in sync because there's a little bit of a delay. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, if you got good enough, like really professional connection, like I don't know, like they do in radio interviews or something uh maybe there's not so much of a delay yeah satellite stuff anyway this band is good yeah 
I like them a lot, and they seem to be having a good time, which is always important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look, it's the man who flies around like an eagle. Look, it's the enemy of all that's illegal. Look at the muscles on those arms, they're like hammers. Look, it's the nut who walks around in pajamas. That's no nut, boy. That's Captain Nice. Nice? Nice, nice, nice. Okay, so, on Monday, January 9th, 1967, two different superhero shows premiered. Uh, Mr. Terrific at 8 Eastern on CBS and Captain Nice at 8.30 Eastern on NBC, uh, following I Dream of Genie. Uh, so, obviously, both were mid-season replacements, just like Batman, one year later, and neither would be renewed for the fall season. Uh, in part, surely because they missed the boat, the Batman bubble was already leaking by the fall of 66, let alone Indeed. January 67. Uh, so, but were these shows objectively any good? We're going to look at Captain Nice this time and Mr. Terrific next time. So first I want to talk a bit about how we're watching these. Uh, a while back, uh, listener William Cole pointed out to us that the full 15-episode run of Captain Nice was available on archive.org. We subsequently discovered that Mr. Terrific is also there, the full run of it. And we've been wanting to cover both of these shows on the podcast for a long time, but couldn't find them. Uh, so we're glad to be finally able to dig into these. Uh, the Captain Nice recordings... Uh, that we watched from archive.org were videotaped from the HA TV comedy network. It's H A exclamation point. The HA this is the, TV comedy network. This is the same network that became Comedy Central. Well, so Wikipedia says so HA existed from April 1st, 1990 to April 1st, 1991. Uh, it was run by MTV, and in 91, it merged with HBO's The Comedy Channel. Uh, okay. And or initially, the combined network was called CTV, The Comedy Network. But there's a CTV network in Canada, too. Mm -hmm. So this CTV changed to become Comedy Central. Got it. So in a lot of these episodes, uh, occasionally in the lower left corner, the Ha logo will appear for a few seconds. And there were a few that also had Comedy Central logo appear. Mm -hmm. So apparently after the merger, they kept showing this for a while. I mean, they're only 15 episodes, so you get through them pretty quick. But, <laughs> but obviously these were videotaped in 1990 and 91. Mm -hmm. and later converted to digital format. Captain Nice was created by Buck Henry, uh, who, of course, was the co-creator of Get Smart. And actually, William pointed out uh, Captain Nice to us because, Buck, because of our Buck Henry discussion a few episodes back when we talked about his criticism of camp and the first arc of Batman in early 66. So, Captain Nice is a sitcom, complete with a laugh track, and stars William Daniels as Carter Nash, who works in the police lab in the Midwestern city of Big Town. <laughs> Population, what, 100,000 roughly, which puts it right um, in the same neighborhood as Cedar Rapids, which is <laughs> our Iowa hometown, also a Midwestern town. Uh, and he develops a serum that he drinks to turn into Captain Nice, which basically entails flight, strength, and an instant costume change. Uh, now, which which is hard to it's it's kind of hard to track how that happens uh, because he takes off his jacket whenever he changes. We'll go. Yeah, into usually this he takes it off and hangs it, puts it on a hanger, and sticks his glasses in the jacket pocket. Right, and in the very in the in the pilot, he also puts his shoes. On, he puts some um, shoe tree type things um, into his shoes. You know the kinds of. Things that uh, stretch out the toe and the heel, or kind mm. of you know, and you know he's he's very meticulous about it, which is really funny the first time out. But if we had to watch him do all of that in every single episode when he changed to Captain Nice, um, we'd be bored to tears. Yeah. Um, so right, but then you know it seems as though he's going to change into his costume, but then he basically explodes his clothes off, I think, the other clothes he's wearing. Right, well, he, because he drinks, he drinks the serum, mm -hmm. uh, he loosens his tie, he drinks the serum, he gulps, he hiccups, 
and then there's an explosion, mm-hmm. and now he's Captain Nice. Yeah, it struck me as a version of what happens to Billy Batson when he changes into Captain Marv. Mm. Suddenly he's got his suit on. Now, I haven't watched any Mr. Terrific yet, but I saw that he also uses some kind of, in his case, it's a pill, I guess, to turn into Mr. Terrific. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this evening I happened across a 1965 cartoon series called Roger Ramjet, uh, which he also gets his power from taking some kind of pill. So I'm wondering what it was in the 60s that everybody had to take drugs to turn into superheroes. (laughs) It's funny. Well, you know, the German translation of the uh, the title of Mr. Terrific, it apparently was pretty popular in Europe, much Mm. more popular than it was in the U.S., because there are both German and Italian DVD um, copies distributed of the series, although they're really boulderized. Um, the German um, version has episodes that are only about 14 minutes long. Mm-hmm. Like, um, But the, the German title was, and my German is terrible, so bear with me. Is this das terrific ge- or nice? Uh, this is Captain Nice. Yeah. Das Geheimnis der Blauen Tropfen, um, which means the secret of the blue drops. Um, so the drug is even the title of the show <laughs> in, that, in the German case. <laughs> and I, I think William Daniels, in the, we, um, among the other things that are listed, along with the 15 existing episodes with, uh, at archive.org, there's also an interview with William Daniels, uh, the, the TV Academy. And he, I believe he incorrectly states there that the German title was something like what happened after he took the blue drops mm. um, or after he took the blue drops. So there may be some um, colloquial or um, idiomatic aspect of this title that I just don't know or else Daniel's got it wrong. But one way or the other, it's uh, interesting that the blue drops are kind of the star of the show, according to the title. And they don't even look blue. They look like a clear fluid um, for the first few episodes anyway. Well, when he first mixes it up in the pilot, it, you know, it turns kind of dark blue or black when he mm-hmm. adds the last ingredient. And you see that in some other episodes, too. But, yeah, there well, are some the episode, where it looks it, clearer, too. It, uh-huh. Yeah, in the episode where the key ingredient is missing. Uh, because he can't get it um, mm. because, you know, it's uh, his uh, requisition has been delayed or misfiled or canceled. Um, he when he finally adds, when, well, when he just adds table salt <laughs> to whatever, mm. you know, because he's missing some kind of sodium. Um, he says, well, turn turns black. That's encouraging or something like that. But I thought of it as a clear fluid from most of the episodes before it anyway. Hmm. So his overbearing mother is played by Alice Ghostly, who really wasn't very well known yet. I saw that uh, because she was in this, Buck Henry recommended her to be in The Graduate, which, of course, he wrote. And then that led to her getting cast on Bewitched in 1969, uh, season six, uh, as Esmeralda. And that was what really got her well known. Mm-hmm. But I thought she was just perfectly cast here. <laughs> oh, yeah, she's great, and she's given excellent lines. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Carter, why didn't you tell me you were coming home early? Didn't know it myself. Is something wrong? Mother, I've got some very, very bad news. Oh, Carter, nothing's that bad. As long as we have our health and as long as we have our friends, there's always a reason to smile and be happy. I lost my job. I think I'll kill myself. (laughs) Now, Mother, you said there was always reason to smile. (laughs) I'll go out laughing. There's no need for hysterics. Hysterics? Who's hysterical? Why should I get hysterical just because you lost your job? Harvey, did you hear that? Carter lost his job. (laughs) He's so shocked he can't even speak. Yeah, I found that when I first started watching this, I was kind of prepared to hate it. Really? For some reason. And I, well, and it didn't help that there were some, like, 
totally recycled get smart jokes in it. <laughs> I um, asked you not to tell me that, says the yeah, mayor. <laughs> well, yeah, I counted. So in five episodes, episodes one, three, four, five, and ten, that they have that same joke. Don't tell me it's XYZ. It's XYZ. I asked you not to tell me that. <laughs> and that's that's Max's line, is it not? Um, in, in, yeah, you, yeah. Usually, Max is the one who says, "I asked you not to tell me that." Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was surprised that um, Henry plagiarized himself. Yeah, um, if that's what was going on. There was also one an, another get smart joke that was recycled once, where he says, "I'm going to do you know X dangerous thing," and. I think uh, Carter says that, and his mom says, what can I do to help? And he says, I want you to talk me out of it. That's totally Maxwell smart, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But as I watched the series, I felt like it was getting funnier. And actually, when I I then went back and watched the pilot, and it seemed a little funnier to me the second time, or I was maybe just more sympathetic to it. Um, Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that it improves as you go. But... By the time it had improved, it had already been announced as canceled. <laughs> <laughs> so, too bad for them. I mean, guess it was some people's favorite show. Certainly, it was... I mean, it turns out that Grant Tinker was really into it. Yes, and really liked William Daniels, apparently. Right, too. yeah. And so, at the time, well, I checked his Wikipedia page. As they got into 67, he was... NBC's head of West Coast programming. Grant uh, Tinker, that is. Yeah, although he uh, he left NBC for a while in 67. Uh, mm-hmm. But he was a big fan of Captain Nice, and in the 80s when he was in charge of the network, he got Daniels cast as both the voice of Kit in Knight Rider and as Dr. Mark Craig on St. Elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Which may be the only place I had ever seen him before this, and I didn't really watch Saint Elsewhere, but I, I never it was did. on. You know, I was kind of interested in it because I believe it was produced by the same company that produced uh, Hill Street Blues, which yeah. I really, really loved in junior high. Now, a- actually, Alice Ghostly was only three years older than than Daniels, which is just <laughs> another. You know, we did a one of my uh, trivia questions on our Patreon channel dealt with like parents and children on TV shows who were close in age or supposed married couples who were far apart in age. Right. So this is another one on that, that list. Yes. I believe I mentioned at that time too, my favorite example of that, which is Hitchcock's North by Northwest from 1959. The woman who played, um, I think it was Jesse Royce Landis who played Cary Grant's character's mother was actually younger than Cary Grant. <laughs> I don't suppose Cary Grant would have, you know, contractually allowed <laughs> the character playing the woman playing his mother to be um, uh, actually older than he was because he didn't want to appear old. Yeah, uh, did you watch on archive.org the um, Captain Nice on Thirteen Week Theater? It's a little eight minute documentary. I thought yeah, that I had a lot of mm-hmm. good information in it. Uh, I put mm-hmm. a lot of it in my notes, including the stuff about Grant Tinker. And there's a clip in that from Knight Rider, and I heard the voice like, Yep, <laughs> that's him. <laughs> <laughs> that's the guy. Um, and that that uh, video also mentions that the Mr. Nice costume was designed by Jack Kirby. That kind of blew my mind. Yeah, did you watch? There's some bumpers. There's a couple of uh, television ads also in that list of yeah. They use that that Kirby drawing. Several Kirby drawings. I mean, well, at least there's there's one where there are three supervillains, and I mean supervillains, not just you know thugs, who are shooting various you know Kirby technology looking cannons at him as he's <laughs> smiling at the at the at the picture plane. So yeah, it was I, I was pretty wild to see you know um, such kind of high period Kirby art. This would have been, you know, 67. He was still working on FF and wouldn't leave Marvel for another two to three years at that point. Mm -hmm. So he was at the height of his powers. Yeah. Carter's dad, played by Byron Folger, uh, he is always reading a newspaper and we never see his face. It's a good running gag. This was a kind of inside joke because Folger was a character actor who was all over TV and movies at the time 
uh, in these minor roles. You know, one of those guys that you've seen him everywhere and you're not sure what his name is. Or you can't quite place him, but, you know, it, <laughs> there are a lot of guys like that who just kind of pop up in every show. Right, and this, this series is filled with those kinds of characters. Oh, yeah, I've got a whole list of uh, m- maybe later more famous actors who were on this show, too. Uh, but, mm-hmm. yeah, so the the gag was that he's really recognizable, but you can never see his face in the show. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, the, yeah, kind of an inside joke. I don't know if the, the viewers would have cared about that, particularly kids. Uh, but it's yeah, it's a, mm-hmm. even without knowing who the actor is, it's kind of a good gag that he's. They they do some funny things with that, mm-hmm. and when they go to a restaurant, then he's got the menu over his face. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and at one point um, he actually shoots through his newspaper. Does he not? He's got a, a he picks up a gun. Um, that gets thrown on the floor in his house, and he actually shoots somebody from behind his newspaper. Right, yeah, there's a bullet hole in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is a good gag, but it is kind of too bad that we never actually get to see the poor, the poor guy still. It's, it's a funny in-joke. And then uh, policewoman Sergeant Candy Kane who is madly in love with Carter. She practically slobbers all over him in the earlier episodes. And uh, the 13-week theater video points out that she's the opposite of Lois Lane because uh, she's into the meek other identity of the hero and doesn't really care about Captain Nice in romantic terms. Mm -hmm. And she's played by Anne Prentice, sister of Paula Prentice, uh, who would star with her husband Richard Benjamin in the sitcom He and She premiering that fall of 67. And that's another show that kind of riffs on Batman, but the superhero aspect is not so central to that show. Yes, I watched an episode of that just to um, kind of get myself in the mood for watching Captain Nice. And I've got to say that um, all the stories about um, he and she, he and she, right? That's the title. It's not him and her. (laughs) No. Them and it. Um, That would be a spinoff of the Addams Family, no doubt thing in it anyway um the <laughs> um the the skinny on um he and she is that um it was a kind of precursor to the um, the mary tyler war show and was as you've mentioned too quite ahead of its time and it really is good it's it's really yeah in, in front of a live audience which hardly any 60s sitcoms were you know, especially late 60s yeah you know it, it's much more like i love lucy in that way which was filmed before a live audience and was a three camera mm-hmm. show but uh, Captain Nice is a one-camera show, as was Get Smart, and Batman, for that matter. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it was unusual for the time, where you get into the 70s, and everything's being filmed in front of a live audience. And the thing tying um, Captain Nice to he and she, or the person tying them together, is Jay Sandwich, or as I like to call him, PB and Jay Sandwich. Um. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he produced, yeah, he, he produced on Get Smart and Mary Tyler Moore, on... Soap, you know, lots of shows. And was the producer, the, the producer, not the executive producer, it was Buck Henry, but he was the producer of Captain Nice. His name shows up as the first credit after the opening, um, the opening theme um, in every episode. Um, and he directed um, just about every episode of He and She and tons of episodes of Mary Tyler Moore as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he was busy throughout the MTM empire once that got started. Hello, I'm Ken Holtzhauser, and if you're looking for something new in comic books, may I recommend my newest comic, The Quick and the Dad, a love letter to the DC, Marvel, Archie, and Harvey comics of my youth. It This comic has everything. It has spaceships, dad jokes, alien invasions, time travel, supervillains, and so many bad puns. Hopefully you'll like it. It's the cutest comic you've never heard of, and it's available today in print and digital from IndiePlanet.com. That's the quick and the dad. Join that other dynamic duo, won't you? Edward and Alphonse Elric, as a result of attempting the forbidden act of resurrecting their mother with alchemy, have paid the price. Edward lost an arm and a leg. Alphonse lost his whole body, his soul now attached to a suit of armor. 
Together they search for a way to make their bodies complete again and uncover a deadly plot by their country's military rulers. That's the concept of Hiromu Arakawa's Fullmetal Alchemist, one of the best manga ever made. Tim and Patrick are rereading Arakawa's masterwork in search of interesting sound effects, translation errors, goofy humor, and oh yeah, a great story. The podcast is The Law of Equivalent Exchange, a chapter-by-chapter look at the manga Fullmetal Alchemist. New episodes every other Monday, wherever podcasts are found. What are you willing to exchange? Now, about Candy Kane, the write-ups on both Wikipedia and Archive.org say she's a meter maid, but there's no indication in the show that she's a meter maid. She's a policewoman. Yeah. You, you don't call a meter maid sergeant. No, no, it's you don't work your way up to sergeant and end up, you know, giving parking tickets. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah, I mean, she's got a gun. She does real police work. It's just that her uniform looks a little meter maidy. It's different from what the male cops are wearing. Right. She's wearing, like, powder blue um, and has a... A red, like a like a straw tie or a string tie, um, mm-hmm. like she's you know Colonel Sanders, but with better you know flair and color sense. But yeah, she's definitely not a meter maid. No, and Chief Seagal um, keeps calling her um, you know the best man, you know one of our best men, as he says. <laughs> Somehow that doesn't even get a chuckle from the soundtrack or the laugh track. Oh, uh, the theme song is by Vic Mizzy. Uh, can you name Mizzy's two most famous TV themes? Ooh, no, I both, cannot. Both 1960s shows. I definitely can't. Um, okay. Well. Go for it. Adam's Family. Ah, okay. And Green Acres. Nice. Very nice. And so since I've, I've been watching Green Acres and I see his name in there in the credits every time, it popped out at me when I was watching Captain Nice. Oh, Vic Mizzy, I know who that is. Got it, got it. I thought perhaps it was a, a pseudonym for Thin Lizzy, the Scottish man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he wrote Boys Are Back in Town. <laughs> <laughs> and arranged whiskey in the jar. Um, all right. So, um, what do we think of William Daniels? Um, it, it seems as though, you know, it's not just Paul Apprentice, or Paul Apprentice, not, not just Ann Prentice's reaction to him, Ann Prentice being um, Candy Kane, um, that's, you know, kind of a parody of the Clark Kent-Lois Lane relationship. William Daniels seems like um, he's very much modeled on Clark Kent, even though he's mm-hmm. a scientist rather than a, than a journalist. Um, he's very mild-mannered, very meticulous. The um, thing is, he's not just pretending to be that way, as Superman seems to be. Um, he is actually that much of a kind of quasi-mama's boy who's trying to escape from that um, that position, that uh, that role, um, but is also you know pretty fussy, um, and, and as as um, evidenced by his hanging up his suit jacket when he changes and needing mm-hmm. something much larger than a telephone booth to change in, like a laundry truck or a manhole, <laughs> <laughs> in order to change his suit. I don't know. I I struggled a bit with him. As a character, I mean, I thought Daniels did a good job, but I wasn't quite sure why they went with that kind of character as the main character. I didn't think that he came off as funny as you know, as Maxwell Smart. Hmm. Well, I guess I wasn't trying to compare him to Maxwell Smart. I was because um, I haven't seen Get Smart in ages, so it's not as fresh in my mind. Um, and mm-hmm. I wasn't thinking Buck, Hun- Buck Henry, funny, get smart, let's see how this measures up to it. I was just, I guess, trying to view it as objectively as I could. And I, I thought it worked fine. I mean, if he were funny the way Max Smart is, he would be, um, you know, uh, kind of a meathead, um, mm-hmm. which, which he isn't, clearly. It's a very different kind of character. Um, yeah. You know, Max Smart thinks he's a much better secret agent than he actually is, but then he bumbles and stumbles his way into solving cases <laughs> and, you know, apprehending um, international spies. Whereas um, there's something much more self conscious, I guess, about, um, or, you know, conscious anyway, about um, 
William Daniels, uh, Captain Nice. He's you know doing what he's trying to do on purpose. Yeah, although he does make some errors as Captain Nice too in the first episode, especially when he throws the dynamite and he blows the wall off of the apartment building. Yes, he is uh, something of a slapstick figure. He's in episode two with the Sheik. Um, you know how Sheik? What is it? How Sheik can you can you get? Is the name of that episode when the Sheik is visiting? So. Sheik Abdul. Um, after he saves Sheik Abdul from the. Um, the cement, um, you know, de- decor from the top of the building that's been thrown on him or knocked off and you know, tossed on him. Um, he drops it on the mayor. And then as he's leaving, <laughs> as he's flying away, he bashes out the entire kind of front of the porch or the um, mm-hmm. amphitheater that they're standing on um, and, uh, you know, gets a big laugh from the laugh track. So <laughs> the clumsiness, um, the slapstickness of the character is kind of consistent. Yeah, and there are a number of cases where, like, he doesn't know his own strength, and he opens a door and pulls it right off its hinges, Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah, and the pilot, he says, you know, I'm going to be a superhero or something, and he, um, he, you know, just kind of slaps the mantle in front of his mother's fireplace emphatically and knocks it off, um, and everything, all the doodads on it fall, you know, slide down um, and break on the floor. So that's, that's consistent, that he just doesn't know how to deal with his powers, but... That actually seems kind of strangely realistic, you know, the everyman. What would you, what would happen to you if you had powers like that? Um, you wouldn't remember that you had them at the moments when you're just making a gesture. <laughs> or, you know, uh, if you're naturally a little clumsy, sure, you're going to stand on your cape and, you know, maybe run into something or throw, throw dynamite away <laughs> and forget <laughs> what the dynamite is going to do. It's a great opening gag, though, for the whole series, uh, because mm-hmm. that's where the, the um, when the people who are just sitting, minding their own business inside the building that gets its wall blown off um, when Captain Dice throws the dynamite. Um, Their lines are basically reconfigured into the opening, um, the the lyrics of the theme. Right, especially the boy and his father, grandfather, I'm not sure, you know, but yeah, that's what they say there is very similar to what's said in the theme. Well, now, let's see how you like it. My mistake. (laughs) It's the man who flies like an eagle. It's the man with the muscles of lead. It's the masked enemy of all evil. Are you kidding? It's some nut in his underwear. That's no ordinary nut, son. That's Captain Nice. It's the man who flies around. Yeah, yep. He's just some guy in his pajamas. Oh, some some nut in his pajamas. Yeah, in in the actual line he says underwear, but in the in the theme he says pajamas. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because it, it rhymes with rhyme. hammer. With hammer, he's got yeah. muscles like hammers. Yeah. Um, I had an eye out for Batman personnel who showed up in Captain Nice. Aren't too many, are there? Um, well, so as far as on screen, I got four. Although some of them I didn't recognize until I saw their names in the credits. Well, the obvious one was Deanna Lund, for me, who plays right. um, who's, uh, Anna, Anna Graham in, mm-hmm. um, in the, the Puzzler episode, correct? Yeah, uh-huh, and... No, 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 in, uh, in the John Aston Riddler. Oh, that's right, that's right. So, yeah, she's in episode 13 of Captain Nice, and in that same episode, uh, Burt Mustin, uh, who played Old MacDonald in season two, Egghead. Oh, okay, okay. In episode eight, so there are a couple of councilmen, and the younger one <clears throat> is uh, Michael Fox, who played Inspector Bash in High Diddle Riddle. okay. Now, even though he has way more lines here than he did on Batman, he's not credited. <laughs> no wonder I missed him. And also in episode nine, whatever Lola wants, you know, Lola is that kind of like manager hostess of that bar. Oh, right. When um, when um, Captain Nice, who's Carter Nash, is uh, next door and he's trying to um, work on a formula and there's so much 
you know, music and drilling going on next door because, <laughs> you know, somebody's excavating and trying to, you know, uh, build a tunnel under this nightclub um, over to the prison cell to get, um, you know, get this guy out. Um, right, right. Yeah. Did you recognize her? Uh, I did not. That's Barbara Stewart, who played Puzzler's Mall, Rocket O'Rourke. Okay. So Puzz- uh, Puzzler is involved. Yeah. And I noticed on IMDb, we're going to be seeing her in Mr. Terrific, too. <laughs> That's interesting. My, my first impression, my impression was that, um, and I you know, checked to see that this was um, filmed at Paramount. Um, it was an NBC show, but filmed at Paramount Studios rather than Desilu. Um, so what they end up with here are people like Hal Pereira, who was um, Hitchcock's and you know uh, set designer, um, or at least the overseer of set designers. He's listed in the final credits as being you know the set designer, um, although mm-hmm. it was usually whoever was was his understudy who was actually doing the work. Pereira was more like a, a manager, but I noticed that quite a few. Um, Paramount regulars rather than Desilu regulars were kind of all <laughs> over the place here. Like um, uh, Simon Oakland, who plays Harry Houseman, um, one of the villains near the end of the series. Um, mm. He um, is the psychiatrist at the end of Psycho, which was filmed at Paramount. So some of these, mm-hmm. you know, contract players, bit part players, character mm-hmm. actors um, are, you know, more on the Paramount side of things. And you're consistently in like Paramount films um, uh, okay. compared to what we, the people we see the most often on Batman. Behind the camera, uh, Charles Rondeau uh, directed three Captain Nice episodes and two arcs of Batman. Uh, Curse of Tut and Death in Slow Motion. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's, he's the only other name I recognized from Batman. Did Victor French? Victor French did show up on Batman once, though, right? Isn't he? In- That's right. Yeah, Victor French was was one of the mobsters in uh, Zelda. Zelda. Mm-hmm. That's right. So yeah, he he's another one who counts because he's he shows up here. That's right. So as. As far as non-Bat personnel who were familiar faces, uh, Vic Tabak, who was later in Alice, uh, John Fiedler, who shows up everywhere, uh, Joe Flynn, Pat Harrington, mm-hmm. Joanne Worley, Charles Grodin, uh, Dick Wilson, later famous as Mr. Whipple on the Charmin commercials. <laughs> Daniel J. Trevanti, who uh, went on to play Captain Farello on Hill Street Blues. Oh, I missed him. What 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 was he playing in this? Uh, Lenny was the name of his character. I think he was just you know one of the goons, but I wasn't able to place him. Yeah, lots of lots of mobsters in this. Charles Grodin has a great part in I think episode fourteen, or maybe it's even episode fifteen. It's the second Medulla episode with John Daner playing the 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 mentalist. Um, mm. Grodin shows up as, as the you know. The hipster um, who you know is trying to get into uh, Medulla's club, and then says, "Well, I'll go back to my newsstand." <laughs> Grown is very yeah, funny. just a little bit part. Yeah, but almost unrecognizable. Correction: Grodin is in episode 14, where the club is operated by Lloyd Larchmont, played by Bob Newhart, which we're about to discuss. Episode 14, I've branded as unmissable. So Bob Newhart, um, he's playing an entrepreneur guy who's somewhere between Hugh Hefner and Elon Musk. Oh, he's clearly modeled on Hugh Hefner. His name is uh, what Lloyd Larchmont. Who you know, he's even got a, yeah. um, uh, alliteration in his uh, first and last names. He has a very high opinion of himself, and he's just hilarious in the role. I mean, the lines they wrote were good, and he just milked them, just played them perfectly, I thought. It's just so f- I'm, He's much funnier here than he is on his own series. Oh, my gosh. I mean, he's, he, he plays, you know, for someone who's really good at kind of self-deprecating humor, he's fantastic mm-hmm. as an egomaniac. He's just completely yeah. Oh, believable. I loved it. And he's also got. I a want pipe. a whole series of this. Yes, he's also got. A, he also smokes a pipe, which makes the Hugh Hefner reference even harder to miss. Since you know um, um, Hefner was always you know walking around with a pipe back in those days, um, even as a younger man. And um, the magazine that he runs, rather than Playboy, is called Apple, 
Um, but uh, mm-hmm. what do they do? They what do they call the um, the playmates um, in the? Are they Apple Girls or something, something like that? I think it's it's I don't know Apple Tarts. <laughs> it seems like it's more deprecating um, than than just Apple Girls, but mm. can't quite remember. Anyway, there's no mention of it being a nudie magazine, but he does talk about um, people do mention models. You know, they're, these mm-hmm. people are models for these women are models for the Apple magazine. So yeah, if you watch one Captain Nice episode, it has to be episode fourteen. I just loved that one. <laughs> Yes, one thing you could say for you know Buck Henry, or you can say many good things for him, but because Get Smart had been such a runaway hit, I suspect he was able to get really, really good people on the team. Mm-hmm. They wanted yeah, to be sure associated. Like they wanted to be associated with anything he was working on, and of course, even mm-hmm. though Captain Nice fell kind of flat, um, you know, The Graduate was a giant hit, and um, Henry ended up you know writing more screenplays in Hollywood for quite a, a number of years. And getting his head half sliced open by um, uh, John Belushi <laughs> on an episode of SNL. Have you heard about that episode? No. Well, um, just very briefly, John Belushi was uh, playing a sam- it was a samurai delicatessen um, sketch in the first or second season of uh, SNL, and this was a, a running gag that um, Belushi would, you know present as a samurai and then he would be like you know samurai delicatessen samurai this samurai Mm -hmm. that just you know add anything to samurai and and play out the premise and buck henry comes in to get a sandwich and um hijinks ensue but eventually um belushi swings his uh his uh his samurai sword and uh apparently scratches uh, Buck Henry's head. He actually hit mm. Buck Henry just a slightly, and so he's you know bleeding a little bit. And so in the next sketch, he's got a Band-Aid on uh, on his forehead, and by the end of the episode, nearly the entire cast is wearing a Band-Aid on their heads exactly in the same place <laughs> that Buck Henry's is. And Buck Henry was a very frequent guest on SNL in those early years, too. <laughs> Maybe I had heard that. I'd kind of forgotten it. So I noticed there were two episodes that were co-written by David Ketchum, mm-hmm. uh, who played Agent 13 on Get Smart. Oh, I had no idea he was a writer. Yeah, neither did I. But it turns out, if you look at IMDb, he wrote almost as much as he acted. He did some writing for Get Smart, too. Mm. Um, and by the way, how many times did he appear as Agent 13? 13, 13 times, times. Yeah. <laughs> 12 in season two and then last his last appearance was the season premiere season three <laughs> so that's hilarious it is um oh um and one episode is co-written by mike marmer uh who wrote 15 episodes of get smart and also co-wrote legends of the superheroes a career highlight for sure. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, they probably thought he might um, kind of you know glitz up the joint, but there wasn't. You, you can't put lipstick on a. Well, warthog. Like he was a better writer in the '60s than he was in the '70s, I guess. Well, I know. you know, the, you can't put lipstick on a warthog, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe a sweat hog. Um, it, it. I don't think it, there was any way of saving that script considering what was uh, what was being asked for asked of them mm-hmm. now i had a question that the show never answered so how does he stop being captain nice because you see him turn into captain nice but well the potion wears off well i assumed that it wore off but in episode three when the caterpillar drinks his spilled serum and becomes a kind of monster it never changes back no oh, it's true i wondered about that too so yeah i mean they they never say how he changes back he's just changes back and they don't say anything about it wearing off or there being an antidote mm-hmm. or it just it never never comes up <laughs> <laughs> yes um my, my impression was that it wore off, but apparently not for animals, especially if they're that small, like <laughs> the caterpillar and the parakeet, um, who ends up um, taking the potion and saying, instead of, I love you, I love you, it says, I love you, I love you. <laughs> um, I was kind of disappointed that he mostly fought gangsters. 
mm-hmm. or you know other like normal organized crime people. Uh, episode one has a kind of a supervillain, Gregory Omnus, who is a master of disguise. Mm-hmm. So at least he has a gimmick. Yes, and a good name too. Omnus, I presume is um you know the same latin root as omni which means all yeah. so he can you know imitate anyone he's he's can disguise himself even as a chair which <laughs> causes <laughs> causes the chief Seagal to say well i can say one thing for him he's extremely comfortable <laughs> <laughs> because he sat in him i sat in him myself during that investigation <laughs> Yeah, that's that's one of the you know bits that made me realize that the first episode was pretty funny. I went back and watched it a second time too, and enjoyed it more the second time mm. as well. Hmm. Yeah, it kind of, the show kind of grew on me. I mean, the first few episodes, I was kind of like, "Boy, mm. this is warmed over, get smart." But after a while, I kind of got into it. Now, so the week thirteen theater video suggests that. Captain Nice, the show, failed because the producers didn't grasp what made Batman successful. And the show immediately failed to resonate with audiences. While Captain Nice was funny, with top-notch writing from Henry and solid performances from the cast, it didn't capitalize on Batman's popularity like executives wanted because the people who commissioned it didn't understand why audiences loved the Cape Crusader. Reading Batman's scripts without the -the over-the-top performances and kooky cinematography, they read like dramas. The humor from Batman came from these completely serious screenplays being played as if they were comedies. Which is, you know, what we call the simply an ideal. (laughs) On the other hand, Captain Nice was an out-and-out sitcom occasionally being played as if it was a drama. Do you think that that's... a correct assessment that they the people who commissioned the show didn't get batman that they were trying to recreate batman or the and they just didn't do it right that's an excellent question and it's really the question isn't it you know especially for you know those of us who are coming at this from the batman you know perspective and I got to say that I don't think, especially considering the um, opinion of Buck Henry that we you know, read in 60, you know, from 66, um, mm-hmm. where he said that, you know, it's, you know, camp is basically giving comedy a bad name. I don't think Buck Henry had any intention of making this camp in the sense of the simply an ideal that you just mentioned. Um, no, I don't think he did either. But I think the the question is, you know, if theoretically, just for me, perhaps... The network said, "Oh, Batman is funny. Give us one of those." So we, so we need a comedy writer, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, Lorenzo Semple wasn't really a comedy writer. I don't. I wouldn't say. I mean, he wrote some kind more. Kind, he was kind of a camp writer, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, performing seriousness, um, but you know, th- it's that performance and the overperformance of seriousness that is, you know, one of the factors that makes camp funny to some people, anyway. Mm-hmm. But you know, if you hire Buck Rent Henry, you're going to get a different kind of funny than mm-hmm. Batman. I guess it, it depends. Yeah. This, you know, the answer to your question depends on who the they is here. Is it the network mm-hmm. that wanted it to be like Batman, or the producers of the act and writers of the actual series who wanted it to be like Batman or cash in on Batman's success? Um, it seems as though it's built. The show is the Captain Nice series is built to imitate Batman only in so far as it's a live action superhero show. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, with hopes that maybe it could be steered in a different direction as a premise into sitcom land, you know, territory um, where people are always saying funny and clever things. And there are some characters who are the dupes of jokes and others who are more, you know, can be taken more seriously as characters to identify with. But I guess that the... It seems like the question that doesn't get asked um, in discussions like this is, was Batman all that successful? I mean, sure, it was a you know <laughs> off the it was an off the charts hit to begin with, but it did not sustain itself. Um, not and I don't think that's just because the show you know fell off after the first season. I think it's in part because it was you know a, it was a 
I hit premise in part because it was so different. And once it wasn't mm-hmm. different anymore, once it was familiar, um, somehow the bloom was off the rose for audiences or maybe just for networks or maybe just the, this is, mm-hmm. the problem is the fact that you know, um, at that time, as I think was mentioned in one of the, um, maybe it was even the, um, the 13 week theater um, video, but maybe not, um, that you know, kids weren't considered consumers back then um they weren't really being marketed to except on saturday mornings by the networks right i think that was in one of the articles that was on archive.org that, yeah that's that, pr- uh, probably kids right. were not considered consumers then mm-hmm. yeah so i think what you're saying is even if batman had continued to adhere to the simply an ideal in season two and season three or however long it would have lasted if simple had stayed on it still would have worn out its welcome even if the quality had stayed the same i think so i mean either it was ahead of its time which i wouldn't argue with that um or it it, it didn't have some kind of sustainability built into it and i don't know exactly what that would have looked like um but mm. you know I'm, I'm not sure that you know we we have been pretty rough on season two and especially season three as most fans of the show are because they see the simply an ideal kind of falling to ruin but the question of what it would have taken for the show mm. actually to you know be able to continue to pick itself up and dust itself off and move on um i i really don't know yeah. what the answer to that question might be. I've, my, my opinion of this has changed a lot since we started doing the podcast 25 years ago. <laughs> it's been a long time. Well, yeah, well, we're going on nine <laughs> next spring. And I hope this doesn't sound heretical because, you know, I would love for the Batman show to have lasted like nine seasons of high quality material. I just wonder what it would have taken in the mm-hmm. 1960s, early 1970s market um, considering what producers at the network and programmers were expecting, as well as what advertisers were expecting, what audiences were expecting, and you know what they would have appreciated the most, you know, Batman was a tastemaker um, in some ways. It created a new, you know, kind of way of understanding what TV could do by adding this this important dimension of camp to it. But um, yeah, I don't. I just don't know beyond that novelty. Um, and beyond the kids' audience, what the networks would have done with it that would have sustained it. I'm not sure if they would have had the knowledge and the wherewithal to figure out what that was, because it seemed to need mm-hmm. more time and energy than the networks like ABC were um, willing to expend on it. Yeah, so I'm I'm trying to figure out why Captain Nice failed. Mm-hmm. And I mean, part of it, as I already said at the beginning, was that the whole superhero thing was on its way out mm-hmm. on TV. It was a hula hoop. Uh, by 67. Mm-hmm. So if that's the problem, if somehow if this show had debuted in like May 1966, would it have lasted a little longer? Mm-hmm. When, you know, Batman was riding high and coming off of season one. Right. Because, you know, it's a pretty high quality show. Certainly the quality of the mm-hmm. writing is is excellent. But that doesn't... Yeah, that and doesn't, the acting. Yeah, and the acting and the, you know, the comedy itself, the timing. Um, I thought that the second episode with um, uh, Larry Mann as Sheik Abdul was just a masterpiece of timing. That guy, the guy, you know, <laughs> Larry Mann as, as Sheik Abdul himself was just fabulous. I thought he was <laughs> great. You know, just all the lines about how, you know, it was very much like lines that are spoken by chaos agents about, um, you know, how evil they are. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And uh, like when um, Sheikh Abdul is talking about the um, the guy on the roof who, you know, knocked the um, giant ball, the cement, the concrete ball off the roof to try to kill Sheikh Abdul. The Sheikh, the Sheikh mentions, you know, a tribe, and he says it's the most evil, cutthroat, you know, violent, you know, murderous tribe of them all. And don't you worry, sir, we'll soon track down that would-be killer. You tell your men to keep their eyes open for a Dalumba tribesmen. They're the most treacherous killers in the Middle East. Bloodthirsty animals who murder and plunder without conscience. They certainly sound dangerous, huh? Yes, we are. 
yep, that's us or something along those lines. <laughs> it sounds like a line that Bernie Copel would, you know, deliver beautifully on, <laughs> on, uh, on Get Smart as a chaos agent. Well, the villains have a lot of funny lines, actually, like in, in the premiere when the guy says, we can't rob that bank. I have an account there. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, use your knives and guns, but, you know, just remember one thing. No violence. <laughs> 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 but you know the, the 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 quality of the writing is 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 very good but you know what how many series do we know of um just that we talked about today that um had great writing but never really grabbed ratings like hill street blues or Sade elsewhere um mm-hmm. you know they they hung on mostly because their networks thought of them as prestige shows and i think those networks were actually nbc um for both of those both of those series um but uh, the same is true of he and of he and she it won emmys for best writing and didn't even last a season i don't believe yeah it was made it made it through one season and yeah yeah, yeah i mean i'm it's shows that have this kind of concept kind of gimmick it's hard to make them last a long time um I was noticing that Anne Prentice later was in, do you remember Quark? Oh, yes, with in Richard Benjamin, her brother-in-law. Yeah, Richard Benjamin, her brother-in-law. And that show lasted even less, I think it was seven episodes, I looked it up. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that you know, it was kind of a Star Wars parody, you know, it's 78. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, that, that didn't catch on either. I don't know, I mean, I think Batman was fabulously lucky to last as long as it did. Oh, I'll say. But there were other shows that had supernatural or, you know, premises like Bewitched that ran for seasons and seasons, even though, you know, two, three, I don't know, five different actors played Tabitha's husband. Um, Yeah. But I think, I think Bewitched, I mean, I think, you know, it's important. A show will survive more if the audience can kind of sympathize with the characters. And some characters are written, you know, Bewitched has that magic gimmick in it, but it's really relatable, I think. And a show like this, it's harder to make it relatable, maybe, because it's not about family so much. Well, I mean, there is the mother aspect, but... But it's not a domestic show i mean no, you know domestic like sitcoms bewitched. have been you know have been perennially perennially yeah, perennially popular um and mm-hmm. you know even shows like cheers and mary tyler moore um basically had work families um mm-hmm. at the center of them um you know versions of family where you know lou grant is the is the uh gruff but benign dad and you know the mm-hmm. bickering brothers or you know murray and uh and uh ted etc cetera, etc cetera. um so there's no there's no unit of the same sort here especially because dad is behind a newspaper and his face never shows but anyway, we don't really have a work family either, because uh, both the mayor and the uh, the police chief are even more ciphers than um, than Chief O'Hara and Commissioner Gordon are. I believe um, they mm. just kind of they, they do a shtick. They're very one dimensional, um, so there's no identification there um, that's really possible. Another show that could have been or kind of was that kind of gimmick show, soap. But it was also a family show. I mean, it was it had fam- not, not, it wasn't really a quote unquote family show, but it had families in it. It was a domestic show, mm-hmm. and there were serious moments in it. And I think that helped it live on for four seasons. And it also had Jay Sandrich behind it directing episodes yep, yep. <laughs> instead of just producing. Maybe if Jay Sandrich had, had directed episodes of um, Captain Nice, it would have lasted longer. But then again, he directed nearly every episode of He and She, and it didn't, you know, it lasted a season and that was it. So <laughs> the formulas are so unpredictable and volatile. Maybe He and She needed to have a kid or something that would have helped it survive. Mm, possibly. Um, did little did little Ricky save the the Lucy show? Possibly, I don't know. <laughs> we do know the cousin the cousin Oliver did not uh, save the Brady Bunch. No, well, cousin Oliver was an intruder. Uh, I think, as far as the audience was concerned, although I mean that wasn't what killed the Brady Bunch. I've been listening to the Real Brady Bros podcast, and there were a, <laughs> a lot of other things, mm-hmm. you know, more than cousin Oliver that caused the show to end. Yes, the booze and pills. <laughs> well. <laughs> 
not I, I don't know about that so much, but I'm just I'm just being silly. I mean, there for one thing, everybody's contract was up after after the f- fifth season, mm. um, and Sherwood Schwartz didn't really want Robert Reed to come back, so mm. Reed was kind of. Uh, he would criticize aspects of the show and we should do it this way. And mm. so, I mean, there, there were, you know, those kinds of issues. And if they had done new contracts with the kids, they would have had to pay them more. So it would have cost more to keep the show going. Right. And there were five seasons under their belt so they could go straight to syndication and, you know, make a heap off that. Yeah, exactly. As they're still, they still are to this day, I think. Oh, Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I say I forgot to mention that Liam Dunn, who plays Mayor Finney, was also a ubiquitous character actor who also shows up, I think, as the as the mayor, you know, once again, a mayor, the, the mayor of the town that Cleavon Little, um, um, you know, becomes the sheriff of in Blazing Saddles. Ah, uh, OK. So that's I, I was trying to place him for the first three or four episodes and then, you know, looked him up on IMDb and there he was. Um, so, you know, the Mel Brooks, Buck Henry circle, you know, kind of kept some of the same comic actors, um, character actors around um, to, you know, keep milking them for all they were worth. OK, well, to answer my question at the beginning, I think. It is a pretty good show. Maybe it just didn't quite have the thing it needed to keep going, and it was riding a wave of a, fa- a fad that was fading. Mm-hmm. So probably not surprising that it didn't last, even though it was pretty good. Yeah, it's a kind of a fun show to binge on, which I ended up having to watch nine episodes in a single day. Um, <laughs> but they're only 22 minutes apiece. But, um, you know, they're they're funny, and even though some of the premises are like, you know, oh, no, he doesn't have his formula, what's he going to do? They're the kind of premises that make me want to cringe when I see them in other series because they just make you uncomfortable or they make me Mm. uncomfortable. Um, It's like, oh, no, he's going to have to do X, Y, and Z. They're so predictable. But um, here, you know, because the episodes are only 22 minutes long and perhaps um, because... They write, they're written better than other such, you know, versions of the same plots. Um, I didn't find that being, you know, uncomfortable in the slightest. Uh, they just, you know, they, they wound yeah. up being premises that kind of worked in this context. There weren't any premises of, like, stupid misunderstandings, like on the Patty Duke show. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I uh, just watched one where her dad overheard half a conversation at the newspaper where he works, and he thought that they were trying to make him quit, that they were going to fire him, and actually they just wanted him to go on a vacation. Um, and the whole show is built around what, how he reacts to this misunderstanding. That's and, exactly the kind of crud I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's just, you know, if it were real life, he would have found out his mistake much sooner. It mm-hmm. would have come up somehow. But, you know, it has to be orchestrated just so that the secret, you know, the misunderstanding is not cleared up until the show is over. Right, and you can just see, it's almost like, you know, the screenwriters have just pulled back the 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 front of the watch and are just showing you the mechanism at work for the entire, <laughs> it's like, this is how this is going to proceed. They're going to delay his, you know, realization of this by mm-hmm. cleverly keeping him away from all sources of information that could disabuse him of his incorrect notion. And then finally, in the last mm-hmm. few seconds, um, this will all yeah. come clear. It's just so frustrating. Yeah. You just want to yell at him, no, you idiot, they're not trying to fire you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's William Shallard, you know, Nancy Drew's dad. Oh, right. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Um, the, the, the pleasures of this show for me are often, you know, characters like Bob Newhart's Lloyd Larchmont or John Daner's mm-hmm. Medulla, who I think is just brilliant. Um, Medulla being the, uh, the mentalist who's a total fake, but um, kind of, you know, winds up being a hero in the last episode. Um, but is still, you know, completely full of himself and a total phony um, at being a mentalist. But occasionally he he drops out of his phony accent and just speaks like a normal <laughs> person. And then his, you know, it's just hilarious. Um, he said, "Well, you know, you win some, you lose some," and then he goes back to his medulla voice. Um, 
Yeah, he's in two episodes. I suspect if this show had continued, he would have shown up occasionally, you know, like a Siegfried or mm-hmm. or a Harry Who or Yeah, exactly. <laughs> some of those other recurring get smart characters. Yeah. Jaime. <laughs> Jaime was my father's name. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, what sad, sad news, though, here um, is that uh, Anne Prentice had a terrible life in, in, you know, near, near the end of her life anyway. It got worse and worse. She apparently had some serious struggles with mental illness and um, actually tried. She wound up threatening, I think, Richard Benjamin and possibly her, sis, her own sister, Paula Prentice, and ended mm. up in prison. And while she was in prison... She tried to, at least she allegedly tried to uh, hire another inmate to kill Richard Benjamin um, and, um, mm. you know, ended up you know, staying in prison even longer, I believe, and then died in the slammer. Um, it's just just just, mm. just awful, <laughs> really sad, yeah. you know, especially considering um, that, you know, she's um, she may not be as talented as Paula Prentice, but she's very good in the show. Um, once I read this story, uh, I found it much much harder to watch it without feeling really really sad. Um, but uh, mm-hmm. anyway, um, just just a, a little yeah. tidbit of you know what what happens to stars sometimes. But I guess uh, both Paul Apprentice and Richard Benjamin are still with us. Mm-hmm. They are, uh, and and also uh, William Daniels, who is now ninety six. Uh, but he's still with us also. I know, I know. It was, <laughs> it's, it's incredible. And his, I think his spouse, who's also an actor, is still with us as well. And she's like 94. Um, mm. So, yeah, yeah. And Jay Sandridge just, you know, died only a few years ago. He mm. had dementia at the end, but um, I think he died in his mid to late 90s as well. So apparently, you know, the sitcom business is really good for longevity. So maybe we should start writing sitcoms. Yeah, well, Carl Reiner, I think he made it to 100. And then, uh, what, uh, who died just recently? Um, blanking on his name. All in the family. Oh, yes, Norman Lear. Norman yeah, he was Lear. like 101. Yeah he, he was, yeah, he was 101. So Mel Brooks is up around that same age. He's still with us, yes. And so. Ed, Ed Asner and... Um, uh, um, I almost called him Captain Stubing. <laughs> um, Gavin McLeod. Uh, Gavin McLeod. Yeah, yeah, lived to ripe old ages as well. They both only and, recently passed. And Betty White. And Betty White. Yes, just short of her hundredth birthday. That was that was a real disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> George Burns and and Bob uh, New so- Bob Newhart's still with us too. So you know. Thank goodness for small mm-hmm. favors. So I guess we sh- we should go into comedy. Uh, it'll help us help us live longer, maybe. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It'll. I mean, I I think there is something to that. I mean, I think. Uh, well, I well, I think some years ago, Mel Brooks was saying, you know, he and he and Carl Reiner and Norman Lear and other comedians were would hang out together a lot and crack each other up and. <laughs> You know, that <laughs> laughter is good for you. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, having a reason to um, exist and needing to write funnier bits um, are, you know, I think, you know, two great tastes that go great together. <laughs> you need to compete with your with your peers and, you know, crack them up as much as they crack you up. And that gives one, you know, motivation to keep going. cheap comic books, right? Well, I'm Professor Allen, and I talk about cheap comic books on the Quarterbin Podcast. In every episode, I'll dissect a single comic from my collection, as long as I paid no more than 25 cents for the issue. Forget about $4 new comics that you can read in four minutes, or crossover events that can cost 100 bucks to collect. Join me in the Quarterbin, where even bad comics are a bargain, and good ones are a steal. The Quarterbin Podcast is part of the Relatively Geeky Podcast Network. Visit us at relativelygeekypodcast.blogspot.com or search Relatively Geeky 
or Quarterbin Podcast in iTunes. I guarantee it'll be worth every penny. Join us on Patreon to support the show and get bonus content. For just $2 a month, you get access to outtakes from every To the Bat Poles episode, trivia quiz videos on 20th century entertainment, and the right to vote on future Bat Poles topics. For a $4 monthly donation, you also get the right to have an ad for your own project on the show once a month and hours of exclusive podcasts. Get all the details at patreon.com slash deconcomics and select the level of your monthly donation. Thanks for listening and thanks for your support. And now our Bat Audio segment, found on YouTube under the title Batman Reunion Party, March 1988. It's an MTV report on a party commemorating the 20th anniversary of Batman's final episode. Apologies for the sound quality, which sounds like it came from someone holding a mic up to a TV speaker. The YouTube video is in our show notes. Holy ravioli, Batman! To the Batmobile! This March evening, the Batmobile was parked outside of the Stock Exchange Club in L.A., Inside it was Gotham City West. The occasion was the 20th anniversary of the week the Batman TV show ran its final primetime episode. We want to grow up to be Catwoman in a big way. My sister called me from San Francisco like with Batman trivia questions like at 12 midnight and stuff. Generations of Bat fans gathered with many original cast members. Yes, there was 85-year-old Alan Napier, better known as Alfred the Butler. And of course, there was Batman himself. Batman is a very weird guy. You know this, don't you? I mean, he's obsessed with fighting crime 24 hours a day. This is not an ordinary guy, you know. And his sidekick, Robin, the boy wonder. When Batman came on, we were the newest and the wildest and, the, you know, I thought the greatest. One of the three actresses who played the evil Catwoman was there. I'm going to imitate her the kid. Oh. I used to take a saucer. Lick the milk out of it. I didn't do that 20 years ago because I never would have put my tongue in nowhere. <laughs> and even Batgirl made the scene. I must say, Adam predicted it. One day he said, This will go down in history. And I said, Get serious. Anybody could be wearing these masks. But he was right and I was wrong. <laughs> I guess that's why Batman's playing to about a half a billion people a day. Indeed, the bat question of this bat evening had to be, just why has the Batman mystique lasted? It's a total fantasy entertainment escape. Dinner, tease mom, monsieur, whatever. Then you got a chance at a classic. It appeals to a whole different audience. Whether it's for kids, it's like hero worship, all right? For adults, it's nostalgia. For teenagers, it's a camp style of taking something that's written hilarious, hilariously and played very seriously. When you think Batman, with people in weird outfits, like the four super crooks hanging around here, it's amazing someone hasn't already reported this place to the police. Whatever the reason, you do have to give Batman credit. The show has lasted, long beyond the decade it helped define. But I'm delighted it worked out this way. Bat Inbox, about part two of our Sandman script episode, a two-part episode. Um, from the all-seeing, all-knowing 66 Batman message board. Uh, 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 sorry, my throat's a little scratchy. As with part one, the comment is from Crispy Critter. Yay! Uh, and he says, You were asking about the operation of the stethoscope in dispensing Sandman sleep powder. It's actually pretty simple. The stethoscope that they used was a Medics Instrument Corporation dual-type with a lever-operated valve that switches the function from bell to diaphragm. The black plastic bell unscrews from the metal part, and there's enough space inside to fill it with powder. To make it work, air under pressure could be pumped in through one of the earpieces from off-screen. Note the way the scenes are shot. The extra hose would not have shown. Mm. Push the trigger forward, and the powder sprays right out of the bell. How do I know? I bought the same exact stethoscope off eBay and rigged it to work easily. I've posted about this prop before on the forum, and he puts a couple of links to other threads on the forum. 
and thanks for the mention in the podcast. Looking forward to the next one. And all I have to say about that reunion show is poor Alan Napier. Mm, that's all we. That's all. Just about everybody has to say about it. Yeah, I mean, he got so little time. But also, as I was writing the blurb for last episode, I kind of finally got in touch with something else that was bothering me is that he and Ross Schaefer were having such a hard time communicating with each other there. Yes, that's Cause, right. Because Alan Napier was old and Ross Schaefer was distracted, I think, because time was running out mm-hmm. and they they couldn't get on the same wavelength. And that makes it extra frustrating to watch. Not only is Alan Napier getting less than a minute, but... <laughs> It's not even a very good quality minute. No, no. And Alan Napier clearly wanted to kind of, you know, go into this somewhat elaborate joke. Um, and mm-hmm. there just wasn't, it just wasn't possible with the time that was left. Yeah. Which stinks since they should have had him on first and let him go backstage and, you know, hang out just to relax. Yeah. Um, it's really unfair. Mm. So next time we'll go ahead and look at Mr. Terrific. Yay. Uh, so. That should be interesting. I have, well, from what little I've read, I think what well, we've already watched the better quality of the two shows. But I was a little concerned about that. But it's all downhill from here or uphill. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can never remember how that idiom goes. Yeah. Okay. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you again in four weeks at the same bat RSS feed. Check the show notes for links to the Solid Ghost Band version of the theme, the Captain Nice collection on archive.org, the video you heard in our Bat audio segment, and the message board link to the thread about Bat Polls episode 210. If you'd like to drop us a line or recommend any Bat audio that we haven't used yet, let us know at batpolls at deconstructingcomics.com. You can also use that email address to make a donation to the show through PayPal. You can also comment on the thread for each episode and each script at 66batman.com slash forums or on our blog at tothebatpoles.libsyn.com. We're on the social media site formerly known as Twitter, at Decon Comics, and on the Deconstructing Comics channel on YouTube. You can hear outtakes from this and every episode of To The Bat Poles and vote for topics for future episodes, by supporting us at patreon.com slash deconcomics. The outtakes audio this time includes my exploration of the reason why, while the first episodes of Captain Nice and Mr. Terrific aired on the same day in January 1967, and their final broadcasts were also on the same date, Mr. Terrific has two more episodes than Captain Nice. The reason turns out to be a bit mysterious, but seemingly of more historical importance than you might expect. Be sure to join us on Patreon to hear what I found. You can also help us out by shopping via deconstructingcomics.com Amazon, by sharing our episodes on your social media, and by subscribing to the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And spread the word, let all your friends who are Batman 66 fans know about the show. On February 1st, our next episode, join us as we dig into Mr. Terrific. See you then. To the Bat Poles is a production of DeconstructingComics.com.